one go. Hey, everybody, welcome back. I am Emily Moyer, and after a more than a month hiatus, Robert is back, and we're ready to matrix match number 27, Robert. We've made the 27 club. We had our golden anniversary, no, our silver anniversary a couple of uh, months ago. Now we're in the 27 club. How you doing, bud? What's going on? It's been a while. I'm good, you know, just uh, staying busy. It uh, <laughs> seems like it's a 24-7 operation now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It never ends. And yeah. And, and time, this, you know, time is just become this complete abstraction. Yeah. Yeah. Total, total, complete abstraction. And um, today I, I, I went to bed last night at, uh, I think, 10 o'clock. And what was I watching before I went to bed? I can't remember. What was it? It was something very inconsequential. Yeah. Uh, then I fell asleep and I don't know. I only really need about like five and a half, six hours. Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> I was up at like 345 and I actually got up. I got up and I started doing things, started cleaning my house. And I mean, I, I feel like I almost have to get up at like four in the morning to get shit done. Yeah. That's where it's at now. Four in the morning. Yep. Yeah. So right. I've been up 12 hours already. Yeah, so you're getting ready for bed. Not yet. I mean, I've got to, you know, I still have, I still have things to do. Yeah. Um, so that's not happening. So you mentioned yeah. time being an abstract. Well, first of all, I was going to ask you, have you noticed now also how, like, everything connects to everything else now? Like, everything bleeds over. Like, you can be down one rabbit hole or one thread, right? And something from the rabbit hole or thread that you were just in, which is completely separate and has nothing to do with each other, like some binding element suddenly shows up in that, right? And you can do this ad nauseum on and on and on. Like everything's connected, the same thing's showing up. That's been a feature of this period of time for me on an increasing level, but also what you're talking about as far as this abstraction of time. I was reading this interesting article the other day about um, black holes and how like that, like you can actually, you actually can extract information from them, right? You don't, like it doesn't really disappear. And somehow like some evidence, some, whatever they're, they're extrapolating from this residue of information is that space and time is only like a, a feature maybe of this of this particular black hole, we're in a black hole. It's a it's a it's a feature of this one, and one and, and not any and not anything else. And if we're moving through some weird part onto like the curve coming out of the black hole or something, this shit is starting to fall apart. I don't know that I understood that completely correctly, but they were like basically space and time may only be features of this particular hole we're in. Oh yeah, that makes sense. And if we're coming out of it, then maybe no more space and time, and we're just experiencing the the effects, you know, on a certain level already. Well, so there's this really uh, obscure movie from the 1970s. It, it was originally called "The Last Days of Man on Earth," mm -hmm. and then they turned it into uh, the final program, two M's and an E. And the premise of the movie is that the world is just coming to an end. And there are all these strange things that are happening, not one specific event, like not one giant asteroid or, you know, not one whatever, but all these strange, unusual, crazy things. And in the background uh, of the film, the, the, the lead character has kind of a, an ongoing conversation with this guy who's an, an Indian philosopher talking about the end of the Kali Yuga. Mm -hmm. and that they're at the end of the Kali Yuga, and this is what happens, is that things become unraveled. Mm -hmm. And that um, because this epoch of time is coming to an end. So literally, time is degrading. And that there is this idea that there would be a new age, like a golden age that would come out of the Kali Yuga, um, and which is not an uncommon, you know, theme, right? I mean, that's part of the narrative. But what happens in the movie is fairly uncommon in some ways. So they decide, they being a small group of people, decide that they are going to create the perfect human who will be able to uh, move into this new, new age, this new golden age. And it would be both male and female. Mm 
right? Oh yeah, that's what's so, happening right now. So they're getting into the whole Baphomet thing. Yeah. And that it would um, be able to replicate itself. So there's a, a, a woman, very sexy, Jenny, Jenny Runnaker. She's a British actress. And she plays this very mysterious kind of scientist. And she displays this ability to like absorb the people that are in her field. Um, it's, wow. it's, yeah, it's kind of creepy. Anyway, the, the final scene, uh, you know, it's a, most people won't see it. So I'll just give you a cliffhanger. I'll blow it here. Um, the name of this movie again? It's called The Final Program. You can watch it on, on uh, Amazon Prime. Anyway, All right. she's supposed to like mate with this like perfect, this guy is a Greek guy. He's got a perfect Greek body and whole nine yards. And she's supposed to, you know, copulate with him under very specific circumstances, time. And they've set up this, uh, this computer. And you look back on it, it's like 19, I think it was from 1972, I think, or three. And I saw it when it came out in the theaters when I was a kid. And, the, and it's this very sophisticated computer. It kind of looks like a joke. But the rest of the movie is kind of interesting. So they have this computer and they've, they've collected all of this sunlight. And so they're gonna run this program, hence the final program. And these two people are going to get it on underneath this canopy of sun. And they have all these kind of cheesy effects and everything. And so what happens is that they blend and they become one person. And everything just just goes to hell in a handbasket. Like um, the, the machine stopped working. There's blood everywhere in the laboratory. It's like, it's it, it's done. It's done, the, that epic, that year of time is over. And then you see the world through this being's eyes. And then the camera pulls back and what do you get? You get a big, hairy crow magnet. Mm -hmm. And and it's like, oh, that's how it works. I see. So basically everything just starts from zero again, right? So, so they get this whole idea of the reset. You just demonstrated what I'm talking about, about everything bleeding over into everything else, because you just very similarly similar like describe something very similar to a rabbit hole that I'm really far down right now like I've been doing a lot of very interesting rabbit hole I'm down a couple of rabbit holes simultaneously that seem to have areas where they connect even though they should theoretically be completely separate and what you just described was sort of very similar to one of the rabbit holes that I'm down as far as what's going on right now as far as what the earth really is as far as um uh, what is going on with the people and the reset and the cycles of it and whatnot. And that's pretty interesting. So you just participated in my everything is connected experiment. <laughs> you know what? The only time the uh, synchronicities and coincidences and, and uh, connections stop when you pay attention to COVID-19 coverage or election coverage. Not if you look at the side stuff from the election coverage, but if you're looking at like the articles about, you know, Michigan and this and fraud and blah, 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 right? If you're off into some of the weird threads, they continue, right? Yeah. But if you're looking at the, you know, the, the standard angry Trump supporter threads, right, kind of thing, or the even some of the Q kind of threads and things like that, they stop, which tells me that all of this stuff Oh, and we know this, but it really is like there's something massive going on that people can pay attention to and, and participate in on a personal growth and metaphysical level that they're trying to distract from. And they have come up with two really great shit shows to keep people busy. And any yeah, well, the yeah. Shit show, anytime you participate in the shit show, your personal exploration stops. Well, yeah, I mean, it depends on where you take the personal exploration, but I, I would agree that it moves into this kind of static space and things get frozen. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, I t and there's nothing enlightening or redeeming or mildly entertaining about COVID-19. <laughs> no.
<laughs> not at all. Not at all. So speaking of COVID-19, you wanted to uh, get into some of the way that sports is being used to normalize, promote, project uh, the COVID world order and the contact <laughs> tracing that goes along with it. <laughs> let's hear what you got. I mean, I've certainly been noticing that since the tennis returned. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous, but let's hear, let's hear what you got and then I'll give you what I got. Well, um, I promise not to um, be involved in fantasy football this year. Uh, like last year, I think I played in like five or six leagues. It's just a way for me to blow off mm -hmm. steam. And, you know, it's, it's like it's like Dungeons and Dragons for jocks, right? Yeah. So um, I wasn't going to play this year, and I certainly wasn't going to watch because I, I think what they're doing with sports is – it's beyond ridiculous. Um, it's it you know, sports has been an American inst American institution for a long time. No matter where you chime in, whether it's a, a waste of time or or uh, you know prolonged adolescent development, whatever that is, it's still been a part of our culture. And what they're doing is they're fundamentally erasing that, like everything else. And I'm not opposed to not being involved in sports, but I think it should be a choice, not a mandate from uh, Davos, which is really what it's training into, and, and, a, and a programming platform for you know the social justice warriors. So anyway, I I just said fuck it, I'm done, I'm over it. Um, the, the, you know, I, I watched no baseball. I didn't want to watch a travesty of cardboard cutouts and stands, just ridiculous. Um, I didn't want to watch players in dugouts without masks and watching the manager and the coaches have to wear masks. It's fucking mm -hmm. stupid. Mm -hmm. it, just, it, just, it just goes right to the hypocrisy mm -hmm. and the idiocy of the whole COVID thing. So basketball, forget it. I mean, basketball started to lose me even before the whole COVID thing. Now, football had always been a sport that was kind of like this last holdout. Right. Even when the, the kneeling stuff came along, it didn't really with Kaepernick. It was it was awkward. You know, it was very awkward. And there was like some owners like I remember Jerry Jones taking a knee with his players like he did it one time. And then that was it. He's like, OK, I did this. I showed solidarity. And then they kind of moved away from it, moved on from it. But then all of a sudden it got crazy again. And the NFL has become so woke. It's just painful now. Because I play fantasy football with my buddy, and all I do is I just watch the stats. I just look at stats. Um, so in order to do that, I've got to keep up on player updates. And what they're doing with coronavirus is Machiavellian. I mean, they are really uh, hacking into people's heads. Because, of course, you want to watch your teams play. Of course, you're involved in some kind of uh, gambling, which is what uh, fantasy football is gambling since I play for money or you have DFS or you're actually playing betting on real games. So you have a gambling investment in these things. So there's some kind of emotional you know, tie to what's going on. And you'll get a player. I'll give you one example. So there's a player by the name of Kendrick Bourne and he plays for the San Francisco 49ers. And last week, Kendrick Bourne tested positive, I believe it was on Monday, Monday or Tuesday, and they had a Thursday night game against the Green Bay Packers. And it was Monday. And then the following day and then the day after that, he tested negative, negative. So <laughs> there's this website called PFT Pro Football Talk, and it's run by this Ex lawyer named uh, Mike Garofolo or Mike, is it not Garofolo? It's a different guy. Anyway, he, this guy's a total, you know, SJW union wonk. I mean, he loves, he just loves the SJW shit. Yeah. And he put, he posted this story on his website that said that Debo Sant, not Debo Sant, Kendrick Bourne's positive test was not a false positive. It was positive, and then he tested negative and negative. Like, what? Like, 
we are in the land of completely distorted and idiotic logic. I mean, it, I, it's like, okay, well, you know, he was positive, now he's negative. Well, now he's negative. Well, what does that mean? Did he recover from COVID or Corona? What do they want to call it? Did he recover from that? Or what's going on here? And, and then there were two guys who was buddy and then an offensive lineman, both of which, all three of which, by the way, were key players. These were not just like Joe Schmo, all right? These guys are key players and they made them sit out. Even though they did not test positive for COVID. Why? Because they were contact tracing them, right? Because they had had contact. So now you've got three players who played the same position, wide receiver, and then an all-pro left tackle, and they're not playing. They had a Thursday night game, and Green Bay rolls into San Francisco and just squishes them like bugs. Like that game, nobody should have been allowed to bet on that game, period, end of story. So then what happens? The next day, they all come off the COVID list. Are you kidding me? Like why? Like all of a sudden they're fine? And then the Oakland Raiders are getting hit super hard with like fines and they lost a draft pick because they're supposedly not uh, following the, the COVID protocol. COVID world order. <laughs> right. And so Mark Davis, who is the son of Al Davis is a very odd guy. And um, he came out and said that, you know, these, these rules and fines are draconian. So you got, you've got at least one owner who is like not down with the program, but it doesn't matter. Look, if I was Mark Davis, here's what I would do. I would pull my team. I'd pull them. I'd just say for the safety of my players and for the safety of the league, we're suspending our season. And NFL, you're going to have to cover the tab. That's it. You cover the tab because we are, we're concerned about coronavirus. And then every single player in that team gets paid by the league and they're done. And it's like, guess what league? Now you got to figure that out. You got a big fucking hole in your schedule. Like we need more chaos like that. Uh -huh. We just need more chaos period. And if I was, if really, if I was Mark Davis to throw a wrench in everything, and I mean everything, I would, I would basically free every single player from their contract, every one of them, and just say, you're, you're, you're all free agents. We're done. We're done. And you turn like 50 guys onto the rest of the league like that and watch these teams like scramble, like, you know, people like, you know, the Donner party, you know, looking for a little <laughs> piece of flesh. Well, that'd be fun to watch. And, you know, just watch that happen. I mean, we need more we need more chaos like this. We need, we need to throw more, you know, speed bumps into this thing. Now the players are also now that I think they also have medical tracking devices, mm -hmm. which are, which are tracking them in real time. Now, this is not anything new. This was started by Chip Kelly at the university of Oregon in conjunction with Nike. So Chip Kelly really got into uh, Phil Knight's pocketbook and started to um, get into like the science of sleep and cycles and wrath yeah. and all that stuff. So they've been r and all this tracking stuff mm -hmm. for at least 10 years now, at least 10 years. So now they can flip it and mm -hmm. basically use it on players to see who they're with, what time they got home, when they went to bed, all, all that stuff. I mean, it can get very granular, I'm sure. Extremely granular. Like, you know, if they're having sex, their heart rate's going to go way up, right? So now the public sees this, and they're, they're getting entrained. And most of the comments I see on that website, whether they're real or not real, I don't know. But they're all pretty much, you know, slave comments. Which is well, oh, these are these are rules, and yeah, blah, 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 I better follow the rules. Blah, blah, blah. You know, it's, it's it's horseshit. So okay, so I don't follow football at all. It's a sport that I, but I have followed a little bit of the, like I read articles about like the NBA, right, and how like 
uh, the NBA is going to abandon some of the tactics that they used this year because it wasn't a moneymaker for them, doing all of this social justice promotion and stuff like that. They lost a lot of money. So I see these. You, articles- know, you know what the NBA is doing? You know what the NBA is doing? Hmm. They're starting up again in December. Is They're that starting up again. You know why? Because they have to, they have to make good on their losses. Oh, like they're, they're in debt now to the networks. So they've got to start up all over again in December. And I don't know how they're going to play. I don't know who they're going to play in front of. But it was just over. Nobody really gave a shit. Well, it was weird to me. Like, so first, so I've been tracking this thing that like going with the social justice route didn't really pay benefits for them. So they're going to abandon that tactic and do something else next year. But what was crazy is when the Lakers won the, Thing, I wasn't even aware that that was going on, really, that the Lakers had made it. And then all of a sudden, the SJWs are rioting in, Cal- in Los Angeles about I, the whole thing was fucking weird to me. So that's all I know about the basketball. But I did. I haven't watched any baseball this season. Um, you know, I, when I when my when I used to live with my dad, I'd watch baseball with him. Um, but I did watch a little bit the World Series because the Dodgers made it. Right. And there was people in the audience. They weren't, you know, it, was, it wasn't as many people in the audience, but there's people in the yeah, audience. Yeah, they, 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 they socially distanced the crowd and the game was in, the game, they, they played the, the games in Arlington, Texas. In Arlington. And they, uh, um, some people were wearing masks, some weren't. I saw people in the crowd without them. Um, it was like you said that the players weren't wearing masks, but the coaches were, and it was weird and whatever. But the biggest thing that I kept noticed, there's a couple of things. I have a few takeaways from the baseball. So um, they kept panning out outside the stadium and they were in some like thing called like Globe Life Stadium. Yeah, Globe that's the Life. New stadium in, in, uh, it's a brand new stadium in, in uh, Arlington, Texas. Right. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Like there's all this like, you know, globe symbolism and, you know, earth symbolism and stuff like that. So that I, they were showing it so much that I had, to, first it was like, okay, whatever. But then I'm like, what is going on? Like, all right, so we're dealing with a field, the flat diamond, that could be flat earth, but they're saying this is globe, you know what I mean? I'm like, what is going on here with this? I think, you know, maybe it's a lot of this, it seems like the uh, flat earth thing is heating up again. There was that flat Toberfest. I know Steve went to it and whatnot. I'm starting to notice a lot more of that activity again. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, And then one of the things that was weird for me when I was watching it was I hate those commercials for AM PM with that Tungus guy. It's like this weird like giant, like it's a giant that has like snack food and candy for its hair and beard and all this kind of stuff, right? And in the commercial, Justin Turner, redheaded, you know, player for the Dodgers who's very good um he's very good but he's in it and I'm like okay what's up something is up with Justin Turner and at, my, at that moment because I'm down a lot of threads related to redheads and orphans and different things stepchildren like I'm thinking it's that but then at the very end of the uh, during the last during game six when the Dodgers won all of a sudden in inning seven Justin Turner had been pulled out without explanation and replaced by Kike Hernandez who had been Kike had been a hero of some of the earlier games in the in the thing but Justin's pulled out we don't know why finally after the game is over and the Dodgers have won but before any of the like press conference or celebration we hear that Justin Turner had been pulled out because he had tested positive for coronavirus right and so that that's happening right at right as the Dodgers win this is coming out right and then of course he came out onto the field anyway without a mask on to celebrate with the guys and I'm like what is going on here with this he's in the fucking Tungus commercial right? Like this weird, like kind of thing. And then he's the one that gets the coronavirus. And after all of these measures have been gone to, in the end, they let him out on the field anyway, without a mask. Right. And it's more than two weeks now. So we haven't heard of that being a super spreader event. Right. So what's going on? Like, I'm surprised that they haven't used that as some kind of excuse or story for anything you haven't heard of, like, you know, we never even heard, I haven't followed closely, but I would imagine it would have been a reasonably big story or my dad would have told me, haven't heard anything about, do the Dodgers have to stay in quarantine there for two more weeks? No, I mean, it's, it, this whole thing is so ripe with inconsistencies. And yeah. I mean, there's, there's, you know, one of my, one of my fantasy football player guys, um, Joey Sly, he's a kicker. And he wound up on the COVID list on 
about two weeks ago, I think, or three weeks ago. I'm like, okay, well, I guess I got to get another kicker this week. And then three days later, he's like, oh, well, he's playing now. And um, it really, he, he never tested positive, but they're, they're really going into this contact tracing territory mm -hmm. that uh, if you have, you know, been in contact with one, this guy who's been in contact with this guy, well, guess what? You're not playing. And they've shut facilities down. Like they have shut facilities down. And I think what's going to happen is that the NFL has already been approved for a 16 game playoff schedule. Okay. Mm -hmm. Why is that? They don't do that stuff unless they're going to pull it off. So here's what I think is going to happen. I think we're going to see this media saturated massive like twindemic okay that's what's coming and they're going to shut the whole fucking country down they're going to shut it all down everything everything and and i think it'll be about as close to mandatory mass they're going to get as close as they can to the european standard and then what will happen is they'll delay the football season and they'll probably start to play some games i'm thinking likely in March. That's what I think. Okay. I think they'll play games in March and they'll probably wind up having the Super Bowl in something like April or May. Now, to your point with the time thing, these events normally like the Super Bowl or the World Series or the NBA Finals, they all happen right around the same time of year. Mm -hmm. Same time of year. So um, that gets fucked up that gets fucked up because they're not having the same time of year. So what does that do to people's internal clocks? Well, if the Super Bowl is not going to be in February, everybody kind of sets their clock by these things, these right. cultural clocks. Yeah. And, and uh, it's just been, it's been totally, totally bizarre. Like even college football, like the big 10 and the PAC 12, they weren't going to play. And it took them, I don't know, six weeks or something like that to finally jump in and start playing football games. So now you have teams that have been playing really since September and you've had other teams that just really started to play in maybe the second week in October. It's totally bizarre. And it adds to this kind of time, thing, time. this yeah. time thing. Yeah. yeah. So, so now when you were saying that they've already approved a 16 game playoff, Right. When is that scheduled for? Well, they they well they haven't scheduled it because they have to have the crisis first. Yeah. Okay. And they and they are priming the pump for the crisis. They're doing everything in their power. Like if I went to Pro Football Talk right now, at least three or four of the threads would be about coronavirus. I refuse to call it COVID nineteen, by the way. Right. Uh, um, now, if you go back three years ago, it was all about concussions and concussion protocol. Yeah, yeah. you thought that was going to be the end of football then, I remember that, all that well, stuff. Yeah. Technically speaking, it kind of was. Yeah. Because after that, here we are now. And the concussion protocol thing is, it, it, it's got a big backseat and to the, to the, to the corona stuff. Um, the other thing, well, there's one other thing that's connected with this. Um, oh yeah. Penalties. I did watch a little bit of two games and the lack of penalties kind of blew me away huh. because the NFL had become unwatchable with yeah. penalties. Yeah. It was just really, they're right. making it very difficult for people. Like if you're going to take part in America's pastime, take this, you're going to have to suffer through it. So the penalties are hardly there now. Teams may get five to six penalties a game, which is nothing. So they've sped up the game. They've made it more watchable. Nobody's in the stands. I did catch a part of the Tampa Bay game against, uh, who was it, the, the Giants, the New York Giants. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was nobody in the stands. And yet they're pumping in fake crowd noise. I mean, the thing is just, we're, we're living in this very surreal um, version of reality now. 
Yeah. So a couple things. I want to get back to some more interesting things I've noticed from the sports, but I want to hit on what you said about that there's going to be a national lockdown and it's going to get as close to mandatory masks as you mm -hmm. can. This is my question for you, right? Like I, I haven't been paying as much attention to all of the mask stuff going on because I just found that that was like a black hole waste of time for, for me, right? It, it distracted me from other things. Why, like if these masks are so important, right? How come there still hasn't been any laws passed? Why are they doing everything through mandating, mandatory, this and that and the other thing? Like, what do you think the reason for that is? If this is something that they're committed to as being part of our future, why are they doing this fake thing? I mean, the whole thing is fake, but like, why aren't they saying, well, no, well, now we're going to pass a law so you can't say it's not a law anymore. Well, I think it has, it just comes down to consent. I think that's really it. I mean, they want people so they're, to consent. They're leaving that wind, that loophole open for those who are willing to stand against the crowd. Because yeah, yeah okay. I think so. Absolutely. They want you to consent. They want your yeah. full consent. And um, they're doing it without making it um, a law. They can try to enforce it, but the only way they can enforce it is through this idea of trespassing. And then you trespass on somebody's property and then they'll call the cops because you're not supposed to be there without a mask. Well, Walmart doesn't make you wear a mask. Walgreens doesn't make you wear a mask. Uh, Target, none of them do now. And the yeah. reason they don't is because they know that it is unenforceable. And not only that, but it actually violates the American with Civil Disabilities Act. Yeah. The ADA, and they know that. They totally know that. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's why. They, they just want people to consent. Okay, so it's just a huge Delphi exercise, basically, which is what I imagined it would yeah, be. Yeah, and they want, they want people to apply pressure to other people. Yeah, they, they, want the, they want the brown shirts and, and the, the people calling on their neighbors and stuff like that. That's right. They, that's what they want. Okay, so now back to sports. So... I had that interesting thing, like with Justin Turner, I thought that was like, if any, I, I had this conversation with my dad too, but he didn't really get what I was putting down about it. So if people are paying attention, like it's funny how like something that would have been a big deal under any other situation suddenly isn't for that one, right? And it, you know, that was weird to me. Um, but then of course I've been watching the tennis, right? And tennis also had their season displaced. And so even though the US Open was played pretty much on time, Right, we had. French Open was in October. The, well, yeah. So I'm going to get to that in just a second. So we had the U.S. Open, which didn't have a lot of people chose not to come to the U.S. Open for a variety of reasons. But then you had this weird thing with Novak Djokovic, right? Who now, granted, like it does say in the rule book, and it always has that if, if he did what he did, then you're out. I some I still feel like if the same thing had happened with Roger Federer, they would have. It, figured out a way to make an exception and say it was an accident. You right. know, Novak Djokovic stepped out really early on and said he didn't believe in vaccines. He tried to do, he did this tour, you know, in this around Serbia and Croatia, where then they got hit with cases of COVID-19. So they did the shaming of him. And that in some ways, even if it was just energetically, like this felt like a certain continuation of that. And then of course he hit the woman with the ball in the throat. So there we are back at I can't breathe again. Right. Wow. Wow. <laughs> the fact that I can't breathe, but also what I started to notice during the tennis. So there was no audience there for the U.S. Open, and they were in the beginning of the tournament doing all sorts of Black Lives Matter kind of stuff. And by the end of the tournament, that was over. They weren't doing that anymore. Like there was all of these banners and stuff before. By the end, there was just this one thing, and I found this really disturbing. It was the fake audience of black people to the front. And it said black people to the front now, right? So like instead of the back of the bus, the white people were back there and the black people were at the front. They had this little fake audience section. But in the beginning, there had been all these Black Lives Matter banners and all this stuff about that. And that seems to decrease over the course of the um, US Open. I don't know if they weren't getting the response from people that they hoped for or what, what it was. But what was consistent all the way throughout was what you're talking about with some of this coronavirus messaging, right? Now, they had a very strict bubble there. So considering the bubble they had, there's not actually any reason that anybody needed to be wearing a mask. 
right? So all of the masking was simply virtue signaling or trying to do this thing like, see, we wear our masks, you know, you should wear them at home too. And they were doing this crap and this shit really fucking bothered me, right? When they, do you know how like they'll focus on the player before their match and they'll do like a little montage of like pictures and stories about them and stuff like that. They would, they would always show us the last picture of the player with the mask on the face, right? And then the player could finish their match but when they would come over to give the on-court interview, they would put the mask on. So they're talking in an on-court interview, socially distanced into a microphone with a mask on, right? And they're really showing this. And, and some of these people, there was this one, when they were doing the video montage from before, there was this one picture of Alexander Zverev, Sasha, uh, who, where he looked so uncomfortable wearing this mask, like literally like he was being muzzled and they were just, like focusing in on it right so I noticed this the whole thing when they're doing the on-court interviews there's a mask but like 10 minutes later they're at the ESPN sports stacks no mask right so it's like this thing of like muzzling the champion muzzling the winner like you, you know virtue signaling to all the people watching at home you know what I mean like this is how we're, it, it was so it was such a gross display you know what I mean? Like I found it really disturbing. And of course you hear the stories going on throughout the course of it, just like you do with the football games of so-and-so from someone's camp seems to have test positive. So now they're running their tr contact tracing protocols and this, that, and the other thing. And of course, during the U.S. Open, Novak Djokovic defended a player named Andrew Adrian Manorino, who almost got the, just not disqualified, but told he couldn't play because Somebody in one of his camps had been in a room where somebody from Benoit Pierre's camp who had tested positive, it whatever. And the match was delayed several hours. And the only reason that Adrian Manorino, who needs the money, right, got to play was because Novak Djokovic stood up for him and ended up, they had canceled his match. And then Novak Djokovic stood up for him and then changed. And then all of a sudden, mid US Open, right around the time all this stuff happening, Novak Djokovic leaves his position as the president of the USTA and forms his own player council with John Isner and a few of the other, like uh, another American player and a few of the other players, right? That will be like a rival player government within the system, right? Almost like they're gaming out, like something that could happen here, kind of like the way I said they gamed out the, the uh, you know, taking down the scapegoat pedophile with the USA Gymnastics, right? So Novak Djokovic gets disqualified the middle weekend, right? He goes, goes home. Few weeks later we have the french open which is now being played at the wrong time of the year it's being played in october instead of may right. which changes everything because clay is the is the most is a very different kind of surface right it changes like the texture of the clay the way temperature. the clay bounces, the temperature the sun is on the opposite side of the stadium than it is in may mm -hmm. right so everything about this scenario like if we're talking about these games as like sort of ancient rituals too, like where they are in ref in location to the sun and stuff is really important, you know, and, um, you know, Djokovic makes the final there, um, but goes down like in almost an embarrassing manner to Nadal. There had been all this talk about Nadal's not gonna be able to do it when it's cold and the ball doesn't bounce as high and stuff like that. I mean, he fucking bageled Novak Djokovic in the first set, right? So like, it's been this continuous shaming of Novak Djokovic on a certain level, right? now. I think Rafael Nadal was the better player and deserved to win, but it's been weird to watch this because Novak Djokovic was on a tear before all this stuff happened. He's still number one in the world. He chooses to not then go across town and play the Paris indoors, which Djokovic, which uh, Nadal played. He goes to some weird, like he goes to Vienna to a smaller tournament and just says, I'm just playing this one because I can't get any more points because I won Paris last year and the way they um, stalled the points for coronavirus, like I can only get points by playing this. So he does this weird thing where he like plays to get enough points to end the year at number one, but then goes out to a, no a player nobody has ever heard of and acts just like, oh, I did it on purpose. I was just here to get points and da da da, -da. Like there is so much weird stuff going on, but he is the, um, to this point, he is the one I see as little as possible wearing the mask. You know what I mean? Being sort of in opposition to, to any of this stuff, but the amount of, they're still, even at all these smaller tournaments, when they come on to do their on-court interview, mask even though yeah. all these things are being played in bubbles without there yeah, was they, they, yeah they do that in football too there's it's just I don't, the ones that i've seen i haven't seen a lot but uh yeah i think it's pretty standard practice now so it's we so even though these things are in bubble the whole thing is fucking weird to me and then the craziest one and this is the one that i'm like what the fuck is what's going on with gymnastics right 
So there's no there's gymnastics events happening in other parts of the world right now. There's nothing happening here. Um, the college teams, most of them are back on campus training, right? Robert, they're training with masks on. They are doing gymnastics with masks on. Yeah, well, they're, they're, they're well-trained little puppets, aren't they? I mean, first of all, like wearing a mask does change your visual field, right? So I can't tell you how dangerous this is for gymnastics. And the people in the gymnastics community are, are clapping at how amazing these athletes are that they've been able to adjust to that, right? right. They're in the gym where there's like chalk dust and sweat and gross stuff and they're wearing a mask the whole time. Like, to me, this is like, this is fucking off the rails insane. Yeah, I think, I think we're, we haven't even reached peak level insanity yet. I think doing gymnastics with a mask on is getting pretty close. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just, you know, you're on a beam, it's four inches wide, how you see it's pretty- no, it's, not, it's, it's not good. I mean, but I, but I think, I think at the end of the day, I mean, something like that will be looked upon quite nostalgically. Totally. Look yeah. at these amazing gymnasts. Yeah, because where I think this thing is going is uh, not good. I mean, I think it's really headed, we're headed to a very, I think, dark place. So Masaki sent me a clip today about Ticketmaster just announced that when concerts come back, you'll have to have a vaccine or a negative COVID test debt to buy right. a ticket. I saw that, that's right. You mm -hmm. see that? Yeah. So, I mean, I have a couple of thoughts on all this stuff, right? Like, and you and I talked about this a couple of weeks ago, I think when we just had a personal conversation. Like, we are at such a stupid reality right now, right? That like, and when you're not paying attention to the coronavirus stuff or the election-y stuff, there's all this interesting other stuff, like uh, realities and truths that are available right now, that, like things that I had been bumping up against walls and not been able to solve or find or get further information or connect it to this, that, or the other thing. All those things are available right now. It's almost as if the system, whatever the fuck this is that we're living in, wants us to figure it out, wants us to figure out our skills, abilities, powers, ability to move between realities, you know, kind of step outside of time. Time isn't what it thinks, it, right? All this kind of stuff that it is literally, you know, people have been so bought into bullshit for so long that it's just daring people to look for something else. And still the people aren't, right? Like everything, I mean, I'm finding answers to questions I've had for the whole time we've been on a pursuit of truth for myself, at least the last 20 years that I, that I couldn't find before. Right. And it's happening during this time when there's supposedly all this censorship. Right. And, and I, I'm not for any censorship at all. Like, that's not what I'm saying. But it's like this game, this whatever the fuck this is, is so stupid. It, want, it, or it wants to be revealed so badly that it's making things this stupid. Like what? I mean, what do you think this is? I mean, do you agree with me about that? Or do you think that like, I mean, this can't well, I, I, I think if you're gonna get any, get any value out of this thing, um, that it probably would be helpful to think about it in those terms. And I guess if you turn your attention away from you know the Sturm and Drang and uh, put it elsewhere, you'll 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 find things that are going to be uh, perhaps a bit more, I don't know. 3D or something will pop out more and maybe make more sense. Uh, you know, and maybe that's part of the plan. Or I, maybe that's what they're offering up here, you know, turn away from this and you got all this over here. If you want to kind of slide down in that direction and you'll be able to piece some things together. I mean, I, I feel like it's kind of like a law of nature or some way, in some yeah. ways. Like if, if, if you have water and it goes in a particular direction, and it gets stopped and that water is continuous, it will either go around it or it will yeah. go over the top of it, but it will find a way through no matter what kind of barricades are put in. Uh, I guess if you want to invoke the Hoover Dam or whatever, you could yeah. probably do that and that's fine, but you know that's only one dam and there's other tributaries around the world. So I, I feel like that that's part of the equation and that this thing wants to seep out and through and it will find a way for those who are kind of open to it and can 
ride that current. And I think you're, I think you're right. I mean, I think that there's a lot more there uh, than, than people, you know, have spent time with or time looking for. And I mean, this gets into the astrology of our time because the last time we had Saturn in Aquarius, the last two Saturn in Aquarius cycles was when reality was hijacked. Like we had an opportunity to create a new platform, like a new platform. And the, the first time in my lifetime that it happened was in 1963 when JFK was killed. Mm -hmm. And that's when Saturn was in Aquarius. So Aquarius is the theme and Saturn is like the signifier. So fast forward, we go to 1991, 92, and that's when we are moving into uh, the New World Order, uh, George Bush, Thousand Points of Light, right? All these, all these uh, coalition of the willing, all this global stuff to rise up against one man, one man. So that was Saturn and Aquarius. And we get hijacked. We get totally hijacked because that was coming off of the 1980s. And in as much as the Reagan era is beloved by certain conservatives, it was also a, a nest for the neocons totally. where they were able to really uh, perfect their, their craft of dark state, right? Their dark state craft. So, but there was a lot of really interesting sort of global moments in the eighties. You know, all these yeah. different festivals, you had the harmonic convergence, yep. um, you had the birth of dance culture mm -hmm. in the late eighties, you know, things happening and, Manchester and, and prior to that, a little bit prior to that, Detroit and Chicago. I mean, these things are starting to happen, right? They're cool things. Mm -hmm. um, computing starts to happen and then we're getting ready to move into um, the World Wide Web. But by the time we get there, by the time the World Wide Web really starts to hit the ground running, we're already, you know, bombing people in Kosovo, right? And it just, it just, this it happens every time we get to this point with the Saturn transit through Aquarius, they grab it, they hijack it, and then they kind of reset reality. And we're here again, you know, we're going to have a Saturn Jupiter conjunction and that's happening in December. And the, 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 when Saturn went into Aquarius early this year, that's when all the hardcore COVID stuff started happening. Yeah. It was a global event. It was a global event, which is, you know, and if you look at, like what happened with uh, Saddam Hussein, that was a global event, right? They turned that thing into a global event. If you look what happened with JFK and post JFK, that was a global event. You had this American president, mostly beloved, killed, Vietnam War, global, 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 right? So here we are, we're at another kind of global apex and they wanna lock down and put us under control because these things are openings, they're openings. And um, not that we were all hunky-dory and kumbaya under Obama, but um, there, there certainly was a sense, even if it might've been kind of an inflated sense of this potential liberation with the election of Trump, mm -hmm. because there was that energy. There was that sense that, okay, this is different. And it was different and it's still different. I'm not sure if it's better, but it's different. And uh, it was like, okay, well, let's ride this energy, you know, because it's an energy. And when Trump got elected, I wasn't that interested in Trump as a personality, but I was interested in the energy that was kind of going to break. He's very Iranian. Mm -hmm. So I was interested in that Iranian energy. Let's break through, let's break stuff down. Let's, but instead it's become something different. And mm -hmm. Here we are, now it's a global event again. We got one guy, right? We got one guy and the one bad guy is Donald Trump. Even though in this country, he's theoretically beloved by 70 million voters. So the difference now though, is we have Jupiter and Saturn together, which we did not have in 1991, 92. We did have it in 1962, that was different. So we're getting close to that 1962 time and that gets us back to that kennedy timeline when everything was moving in one direction and then 
Kennedy, and then we're off on another timeline. So in February of this year, a lot of the planets that were around during February 1962, which by the way, is the chart that's known as the Antichrist chart, those planets will be coming back. The, that stellium of all those Aquarian planets, will, with the exception of Mars, will be around us again. So it's going to be an interesting time. And I think, you know, I've been watching um, a little bit of Bob Lazar. Mm -hmm. uh, like the first, the very first thing he did, which is pretty dry and nerdy, but he talks about the, the, the this idea of how extraterrestrials travel mm -hmm. and that they don't use propulsion, but what they do is they, they fold time, right? Mm -hmm. They don't go from point A to point B, but they fold the space between them. Yeah. So I've been thinking a lot about that. And I think, I think that that's a really kind of crucial uh, piece for us mm -hmm. and that we have to practice figuring out how to full time. Mm -hmm. And it, it really is, I think, um, our, our life raft in some ways. Totally agree with you completely. Yeah. And that we have, we have to envision a possible future that is different than the one that is being created for us in a very, um, an interesting way and then fold that reality into where we are now that's exactly so what, what i'm saying how this system is challenging us to fucking figure it out by presenting such dumb like literally like if you can figure out how to fold time and fold space right on certain levels then you can theoretically evade right all of this harsh bullshit lockdown caca crap right if you can simply step outside of time and back in right if you simply can move from one place to another without having to pass through the gate or the barrier or whatever right then you can carry on with your life like there's like there's been this imposed wall intentionally whether it be a wall of space or a wall of time because the system is challenging people to learn how to move through it Right. In my opinion, the system wants to be revealed, like, you, you know, kind of thing. It wants us to know for whatever reason. Right. And, and I think that's available right now. Like, you know, I think that is. Um, I've been watching some interesting. I'm very taken right now with certain ge geometries, certain symbolisms. Right. Certain. Uh, ways that energy works in terms of free energy. Mm -hmm. Right. And when I'm the things that I've somehow been most focused on all seem to have the similar sort of geometry or layout plan. Right. Like, so I found this video the other day that was how you draw a Masonic floor. Right. And this drawing matches up to some of these other diagrams that I've been looking at, that, right, for free energy and things like that. Right. Mm -hmm. And looking at, someone in the chat in the comment says, Stupid, I've been in a Masonic Lodge. That's not how you draw the floor, you, you, you know, or whatever. He's like, no, you can draw like the geometry of the Masonic floor anywhere like around you. You can create that space around you anywhere, right? And I think there's something to this. Like we really have to learn how to sort of project fields, right, around us so that we can fold space, so that we can fold time. When I watched, I went back and I looked at the video of Walter stepping into the pocket universe on Fringe. He did the same diagram as this drawing of the Masonic floor to step into the pocket universe. And when you go into the pocket universe on fringe, right? So this, he found this building where there was like a sort of rip in the fat, a, you know, a thinning of the fab space, space time sort of thing, right? So maybe there's areas in our world where it's a little bit looser to play with that kind of stuff, right? And he goes and he does the steps and he steps into a universe where time is completely different. Right. Like the, when you go into the universe, like time is really, really slow. Like you feel like you've been in there for like days. When you come back out, it's been years kind of stuff. Right. So uh, a technology, a, a personal technology that you can deploy at your own will might be really useful in a time like this. Well, I think it'd probably be critical. I mean, yeah. So a lot to say about that. Um, but I think that's the next level that we have to go to in mm -hmm. And I think that uh, by necessity, we'll probably, some of us will, will have to, you know, really put an effort into that. It sounds like that's what you're doing. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, 
reality doesn't always match up for two people in the same place. No. I remember one time when I was in uh, junior college and it was, it was, it was a morning class, it was an English class. And uh, I used to be in the habit of getting high before I went to school. Good for you. Yeah. So um, didn't really help my grades much, but it made <laughs> things a lot more fun. Yeah. So I, I got, I remember getting high this one day and uh, I go to class and I'm like sitting there and I'm yawning and I'm just, you know, I'm being just a, just a slouch, right? And the teacher is talking, lecturing, and the guy behind me yawns one time and he yells at him mm -hmm. for yawning. Mm -hmm. and, he got pissed. and he got pissed because he knew the guy behind me knew that I was doing all the yawning. <laughs> and he says, it's him. He's the one that's yawning. And, and the teacher kind of like, you know, doubled down a little bit. I'm like, what was that all about? You know, it's like there, there were different realities happening. We were out of phase with the time that they were all experiencing because when you do marijuana or any other drugs, it puts you in phase with something else. Like I know from my experience, particularly with meth, but I've had enough experiences with marijuana that like I was migrating at a different frequency than everybody else. And that enabled me to see certain other things and miss others. Like, I love talking to uh, your buddy, Darren Williams, right? Because he experiences the world at a completely different pace than I do. So things that would never occur to me occur to him. So when he and I get together and chat, it's really interesting. It's like, you know, when you've been examining the art from the opposite ends of the room and you have a different perspective, right? You know, I think there's really something to that. I've had some of that really weird, like time doesn't seem to pass at all when you're on marijuana. Right, like kind of you think it's been, yeah, I remember stand when I had smoked pot when I was working at this job and I was like making a sandwich and I fucking realized, oh my God, I just took like three days to make this sandwich. But when I turned around and handed a lady's sandwich, it was like, she didn't seem to think anything was wrong, but I was like- Right, oh. right, 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 right. Yeah, so, that, yeah, no, so that's a really interesting point because, you know, where does time occur in the brain? Mm -hmm. that you, change your, you change your brain chemistry and everything obviously changes along with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, yeah. All right, so I popped in, I catch bits and pieces of your shows. Most mornings I'm there for at least a little bit. Um, but, you know, I, I did miss some period of time when we were going through stuff with Olivia. Um, but, uh, and thank you, by the way, it was nice. You did a little, a little tribute to Olivia and told everyone to send me some love. And that was much appreciated that day. So thank you, Robert. Um, but, uh, so I, I pop in here and there, right. And listen to what you think is going on and some stuff I'm like, eh, I don't know other stuff. I'm like, yeah, yeah, for sure. Right. Like you have, you throw out a lot of stuff. I did miss what, what it was this morning that you said that Tucker's tell was, and I'd like to hear about that. But I would like to know, like, I, I also thought your piece at uh, um, the Four Lands, the Four Seasons landscape was interesting. And you brought up what I had been thinking about the Dominion, the Dominion, you know, uh, software system and Mike Pence being a Dominion. And you were looking at the board on the back. Um, my friend Michael Wan also did a, an interesting decode. And he brought up some of some similar things and some different stuff. My question to you is, have you watched the TV, the new series, The Queen's Gambit? I don't, I don't watch TV, really. Okay. So if you get a chance, okay. this one is fucking good, Robert, and it's fucking loaded, right? And there's a lot of information there about projecting game boards and taking the game, taking the game off the board and things like that. And I felt like there was some interesting game board symbology being played there that relates to this, to some of the stuff that went down, you know, in the Queen's Gambit kind of thing. Yeah. So I thought I actually thought you had some really good points in that one. Um, what do you think is going on? Like your distilled sort of thing right now, like what, where you're at today, like what are we fucking looking at here? Well, I think first of all, the whole Biden campaign was about as close to a hologram as you can get. Deep fake all the way, yeah. Really just yep. mind-blowingly fake. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't even think that that's Joe Biden. And I know a lot of people think that when you have plastic surgery, they attach your earlobes. I mean, those are two different ears. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know who this guy is. I don't know what he is. Who do you think you are, Dallas Goldbug? <laughs> that? I said, who do you think you are, Dallas Goldbug? <laughs> well, you, no, I, I mean, 
I'm I don't think I don't think he's I don't think he's I don't think he's somebody besides Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think he's a clone either. Yeah, because he looks too different, and the, and his his hair pattern is not congruent. Like if you go back and look at Joe Biden in the '90s, like the early '90s, he's got the hair pattern of a guy who would lose everything on top mm -hmm. and just have this kind of, you know, rug around the side. And this guy does not have that. He has this kind of comb back thing. Joe Biden didn't have that amount of hair, you know, like when he was in his forties. Yeah, yeah. So there's that, the hair pattern's different. The ears are different. Um, so, so there was this guy, uh, what was his name? Uh, Pete, Dr. Peter, Peter Beater, that this guy talks about robotoids. He talked about these robotoids a long time ago yeah. and how the robotoids were the first kind of incarnation mm -hmm. of re replacements. Yeah. And then, and then the U S came along and started to do the cloning stuff, but they were different. And I think. I think Biden or whatever this guy is, um, is either a robotoid or some kind of a sim. Mm -hmm. And there was a strange, uh, well, like his, his acceptance speech was really bizarre. Like mm -hmm. it happened in a studio. Mm -hmm. Like it was in a studio and there was a green screen and they were projecting onto this open space with all these brand new Jeeps that nobody was in. Right, that was so weird, yeah. I mean, the whole thing, and then supposedly there's Hunter Biden standing next to him, and, and that's not Hunter Biden. Whoever that individual is, it's not Hunter Biden. The ears are different, the eyes. Hunter Biden has blue eyes, and that guy has brown eyes. Oh, yeah, I saw you on that part, yeah. So, so, the, so we're participating in kind of this whole scale um consent of this false reality that's what's happening mm -hmm. like we're being kind of you know led by our noses through this false reality a fake election uh, an election that was hijacked um, reality is being hijacked and i think that there are factions that are trying to really make power plays right now and uh, you've got whatever is going on with the with the Biden, Harris, Obama, Brennan world. Um, they're one group. And maybe you've got the subgroup with the Bushes and the Clintons. And then there's this other group that Trump is a part of. And I don't and I don't think he's I don't think he's in league with these people, although certainly he's done business with them. But I think he's got this other group and they're trying to run. They're trying to run the game. And then you've got the, you know, the fourth economic uh, industrial revolution guys out of Davos who are basically creating the, the lockdown reality. And, and I think- Do you think that's a separate faction than the Biden Obama? Uh, no, I think that they would gladly play with that faction. Okay, but so they're like a lot allied factions, but not necessarily the same faction. Yeah, like, so Australia, all in they're all in with the davos thing and australia is essentially owned by the ccp now they're yeah, really a satellite yeah, CCP. Yeah, too, yeah. so if that's true then you just have to look at the connections between the bushes and the clintons who did business with china for you know, the clintons made china the most favored nation trading status brought them in i think into what the g20 so, and I don't know if they're the G8 now, but they they got brought in and the Clinton, Clinton sponsored them, pushed for them. All these trade secrets are given away. Yeah. So um, what's his name? Klaus Schwab. He basically goes from, from uh, Israel to Beijing and Shanghai. Yeah. Like he teaches at Yeshiva or Shanghai University. Have you seen, have you seen how Kamala Harris's um, dad and parents basically were funded in the same way for their activities by the Ford Foundation that Obama's mom was. You know, um, her dad is a is an economist at Stanford. He teaches at Stanford, yeah. He teaches at Stanford, right? But he was on like when he did his stuff in India, where he met 
Kamala's mom, he was being funded in a project by the Ford Foundation. Yeah. Just like Stanley Ann Dunham was being funded by the Ford Foundation when she was on those missions where she met Obama's. It's exactly the same, but reverse. Kamala is a girl, and she and it was her dad finding the mom right. and a boy and or supposedly whatever. And it right. was right, like it's almost the exact same thing. And there's crossover in time. It's very interesting. Yeah, I yeah. So I have noticed the the Obama connection, not to that degree, but I certainly it's there. Mm -hmm. um, I have a theory that um, that Obama's father is is not the Nigerian guy. No, not the Nigerian guy. He's not the Nigerian. In fact, I have a theory that of Obama's father isn't even black slash African American. I think you can cross them all off the list. I agree with you. I, I Frank Marshall Davis, cross them all off the list. All of them off the list. I agree with you. So I, I think Obama's father is Michael Rockefeller. Okay. That's who I think. Yep. All right. I'm going to go look at that real fast. Because Michael Rockefeller was hanging out in uh, the uh, uh, Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, that whole kind of subcontinental area. That's where he was. Okay, so Michael Rockefeller is a white man, yes? Yep. Am I looking? Okay, so we're saying then that Obama's mom then wouldn't be Stanley Ann Dunham. No. So I, th I, think she's, I think she's Indonesian royalty. Okay, that's interesting. Uh-huh, yeah. And because there are some similarities i can see what you're talking about yeah if you look at obama and you look at his hair i think his hair is a dead giveaway like he's always had that really close cropped kind of thing going on well why why is that because i don't think that that kid that played basketball at P punahu uh academy is obama i think it's a different kid i've looked at those pictures Mm -hmm. That kid looks like he's O.J. Simpson or something. <laughs> Seriously, yeah, O.J. Simpson's kid. It doesn't look like him. I, I think I think there has been a lot of moving around of this Obama identity, and and Stanley and Dunham, you know, lived in Indonesia. So, like, it's a, it's kind of like the moving around of the Obama identity, kind of like the moving around of the beat like the way the beatles like different people play the right role. right like different like different yeah different calls or different jobs on tour and they have a different cast in each city but it's the same show right yeah something along those there, there was this guy that did this um so is that why we see a different kamala harris now than we saw before that we have a different quite well, possibly and you can even see like the fake kamala harris in florida yeah when she was campaigning there and that was not her laura loomer for all of her goofiness was actually right about that <laughs> um so yeah i don't think so stanley dunham was in indonesia with lolo sotero right and lolo sotero was incredibly rich people don't know that he was very he was extremely wealthy and they were they were involved in the overthrow uh, well, they weren't involved in the overthrow of the government per se, but um, there were factions. There was Suharto and Sukarno, and uh, that movie, The Year of Living Dangerously, with Mel Gibson, is all about that. And what happens is that there's this kind of communist sort of push. Like, you know, there's, I think it's Sukarno who is for the people, and Suharto who is going to be the tyrant, right? And so they smash these people who are the dissidents and they want to have a more kind of representative government. And when that happens, that's when all the multinational corporations move into Indonesia and start um, basically pillaging Indonesia. And, and uh, Stanley and Dunham is there and she's there with the, for the IMF and... Yeah. Right. And she's so this is this there's a strange connection with Indonesia. So yeah. I think I think Obama is actually probably connected to that family. Huh. Right. That family. And if that's true, that means he's connected to, to Bill Clinton in his bloodline. Because Bill Clinton's father is Winthrop Rockefeller. Right. Is a Rockefeller. 
it's interesting. There's also a Geithner connection with the with the Kamala uh, the Harris thing. So there is some fun, funny, funny fuckery going around going on uh, with all this. Do you think we're looking at this situation where they've quote unquote declared Biden president elect? So that the uh, chaos and the anger will be even greater when it is found out later that Trump is going to be the president. Well, yeah, of course. I mean, they want they want to create as much chaos and, and division as possible. And I think I think you know Trump likes to play that card too. And do you think that that, that that's going to be based on uh, him proving uh, election fraud and voter fraud, or do you think it's going to be based on him? invoking this arcane congressional process that we've been hearing about in, in some threads for the last couple of days. Well, what will happen if, if uh, Rudy Giuliani has his way, what will happen is that the votes will get disqualified. So for instance, uh, Philadelphia um, has thrown away all of the envelopes that the mail-in ballots came in. That means you cannot match those ballots up with the original signature, theoretically, of the envelope. The envelope was the thing that connected the ballot to somebody else. They mm -hmm. don't have those anymore. They have the ballots, but they don't have the envelopes. So if they can prove that there's voter irregularity, then they can, they can basically flush all those ballots. They're done. And then what they want to do is they want to invalidate the election. Yeah. That's, that's the goal. They don't want to recount. They want to invalidate the election because once the election is invalidated, it probably winds up going to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court tosses it back out and says the states have to uh, figure this out. So the states have state electors. Yep. And they are bound by electing um, through their uh, party affiliation. Yep. So if the state is Republican, yep. then they have to vote for the Republican candidate. That's it. That's it. So right now it stands as at like 30 some odd states to 17 or 18 some odd so states. So then it would be a further outrage amongst the left when this happens, because once again, he didn't win by the popular vote. This is even worse than the electoral college. And this, this is, so their next fight will be, we have to end states' rights. Well, I think they'd probably- the power, we have to end- have, well, yeah, well, that's going to open up a whole can of worms. You, you end states' rights, and now you're giving all the power to the federal government. And uh, you want to do that under under Donald Trump's watch? No, no, but they did a lot of other weird things under Donald Trump's watch that didn't make make sense, right? But this yeah. is all this isn't this isn't to benefit the people who are anti-Trump. This is to benefit the global powers that be, right? And they're able to get away with certain things when you have a Donald Trump in office because the left will do anything that seems to go against how he got there. Right. right? None uh, of yeah, I, here's what I think, I think what they'll do is they'll probably, now I've heard through the grapevine that everything's gonna go dark for 10 days. That's what I've heard. We've been this is not some Q shit by the way, yeah. that they're going to pull the plug on the internet. Uh, they're going to pull the plug on communications, like dark. Mm -hmm. And when the lights come back on, it will be a different place. Mm -hmm. And there will be a different order in place. And, um, you know, I, I think it's a real sketch territory mm -hmm. because if they go through with this strategy, and they actually get him elected um, or reelected, then I think we're looking at a very serious martial law situation. Mm -hmm. I think that I think the left will lose their minds. Mm -hmm. They'll lose their minds. And now we're at a point where if he doesn't get reelected, I don't think the, the people on the right are gonna just say, oh, hey, you guys you know, pulled that one out. No. Neighbor, right? That's not going to happen. No. This is never, ever, ever going to be put back together in the near future. Maybe somewhere down the line, but not now. How do you? I, I, well, you don't watch stuff, but that, where we just started watching The Man in the High Castle, which is based on a Philip K. Dick thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pretty resonant for me as to where, where we may be going. Mm -hmm. Well, so the theor so the premise of that is that the Nazis win. World War II, and then they have this 
hardcore kind of technocratic surveillance state. I think we're, we're on the precipice of it right now. What it is, is you have the Eastern part of the United States under Nazi right rule. You have the Western part of the United States under like Japanese mm -hmm. um, rule, because they, right? And then you have a neutral zone in the middle that has more freedoms theoretically, but also its own set of controls because this is sort of where the warfare between the two sides sort of happens, right? Mm -hmm. we're, only on, we're only on the third episode, but there's a resonance to the feeling of this for me, right? That there's no way, I mean, no matter what happens here, half the country is gonna think that the election was stolen from their guy. Like, you know what I mean? Like this, whatever this is that we've been watching, it has evaporated any belief that people could have had in, in our system. Right. No, it's done. It's over. Like it, there, there'll never be another election again in, in that way. If we're if there will be an election, it'll be yeah. some kind of blockchain thing. Or if votes are counted, um, everybody who's counting the votes will be in front of a monitor and they'll have cameras looking at them, staring back at them, making sure that everything else. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, we're kind of headed in that direction. And um I don't, you know, I don't, I was watching, um, what's that guy's name? Roy Potter. Do you know Roy Potter? Yeah. He's a nice man, actually. He is. Um, today, he was really, he was, he, you could tell he was visibly agitated. And um, so he thinks that Trump is the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. And that he is a polyon and that he is going to deliver the vaccine. Mm -hmm. that's that's what he thinks and he thinks that uh it could happen anytime between now and thanksgiving yeah and um and he's probably right and i was watching tucker last night if you want to talk about that yeah i do want to talk about yeah let's talk about tucker and and, and then we'll i want to kind of circle back to this let's talk about tucker first and then i'll get well, to so, so there we'll lead in with a segment on tucker with, with this guy Dr. Mark Siegel, who is one of the most painful people to listen to on TV. Do you know who he is? He's 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 the the expert, the medical expert that he brings on to talk about coronavirus. I, I'm sure I've seen him. The name sounds familiar. Anyway, he was saying he was touting this guy, General Perna, who's going to be he was in charge of Operation Warp Speed. Right. Anyway, um, he was going on and on about. And he says. Just Tucker, you know, when he was asked about what he's going to do, do you know, the, he used one word, Tucker, one word. Do you know what that word was? And Tucker's like, what? He says, execute, execute, execute. He said it three times. Like, what? Like, I want to hear execute when you're talking about vaccines, please. Mm -hmm. The whole thing was just like completely surreal. And... Um, it was just bizarre. So anyway, Roy Potter thinks that this is what's going to happen. And then you, if you, if you resist, if you say no, you're on a list and then, then it becomes challenging for you. Um, but Tucker last night, he said two things. He said something about being forced to take the vaccine. It was a weird comment. He was trying to be funny. It was almost like something was kind of slipping through. And then he then he did this thing where he was talking about whether, you know, he may or may not have enough votes to be reelected. Re but he went like like this. He did this thing with the side of his eyes. He didn't keep contact mm -hmm. with the camera. So he knows something. I don't know what he knows, but he, he knows something. And in that moment, it was a it was a very interesting tell. So it wasn't about really what he said. It was just that you felt like either he was doing that to sort of was it subconscious or did he intentionally do that? No, I think it was subconscious. Okay. Um, because he was basically trying to play center field on this thing about whether or not he'd be able to you know retain office. But when he was saying it, he did this thing with his eyes. And I've never seen him do that before. He usually is very earnest oh, and yeah, straight yeah. into the camera. This was different. He broke eye contact. He looked away. 
because there's something he knows. I don't know what it is. And um, he, he also, I think it came out today on one of the English newspapers that he doesn't think that Trump has enough votes or a case to be reelected. I think that came out today. I, would, I think Uncle Glenn brought that up in my chat room today. So that's been a major kind of shift because Tucker has been, for all intents and purposes, pretty loyal to Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. That didn't sound like it was very enthusiastic. And then Sean Hannity was supposed to have this woman on last night who is a, uh, uh, work, she, she works for Dominion mm -hmm. and they didn't have her on. They canceled it. But I did see the, I did see the interview on like Red Pill 70 or one of these Red Pill channels. So yeah, I, yeah, this whole thing is getting, and then there's the military side of things. Mm -hmm. So Esper basically gets canned. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, he's pretty worthless anyway, in my estimation. He's a CFR guy. So they bring in this other guy who has a bunch of uh, experience in cyber intelligence and cybersecurity. So that tells you where the next level of warfare is going. Mm -hmm. And then all these other guys from the DOD step down, like they're gone. Mm -hmm. And Trump didn't ask them to leave. They just, they're just gone. And then the, the guy who is, works for the Department of Justice, I think, he's the, yeah. the election guy, Pilger. Yeah. Pilger's gone. He leaves. Because Barr says, well, we're going to get into this. We're going to, we're going to investigate this. So he leaves. But that guy worked for Eric Holder. And he's a holdover from Obama. Yeah. So, so if, if you're keeping score at home, you're probably pretty okay with that. Um, but then there was a really big arms deal, either yesterday or the day before yesterday, with Saudi Arabia and um, the UAE selling them a shit, shit ton of, of weapons. Like, why are they selling them all these weapons right now? You know, is, is Trump going to go to war with Iran? Is that his promise to get back into the office? I don't know. But they've just linked Iran to Venezuela with these hypersonic missiles um, that Iran supposedly sold to Venezuela. But they already had the hypersonic missiles. Russia supplied them. with. They're already there. So I'm not sure what the big deal is unless... The, the big deal is the fact that Iran sold it to them. There, so there's this thing going on now with Iran and the possibility of, of a war there. And I would not be surprised if that happens. I wouldn't be surprised, especially after they just sold all those weapons. And you notice how all those, I think there were at least three countries that <clears throat> came up with like a little peace pact with Israel, right? They, 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 that was fine. Is that yeah but this whole like you know people are louding trump all the time about how he's bringing peace to the middle east and all that kind of stuff right but you know there's no resolution of the situation with palestine there's been no resolution of the situation between israel and syria or israel and iran it's like you know it's like he's like going around the edges and not going to right kind of thing like, well, create, they created an alliance is what they did. Yeah. They created an alliance. So now they could weaponize that alliance. Totally. I, completely. This is not a Middle East peace deal. Yeah. This is not bringing peace to the Middle East. This is exact weaponizing the idea of peace or alliance. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a, there's a lot happening. And while I am actually in favor of Joe Biden not getting in and this, all this fake bullshit, while I'm in favor of the election stuff being exposed. Yeah. Um, you know, I think we're headed into a dark territory. Yep. A dark territory. I, and, I, go ahead. And I think, but I, I also think we have to be very resolved around certain things. And the resolve is number one, we're not gonna let anybody theoretically hijack the process, even though the process has been hijacked for a long time. Um, and I think we have to really draw a line in the sand with the corona and, uh, and what's happening with that and the lockdowns and the vaccines. We have to have results. We can't do it. We can't do it. And people need to fucking just open up their stores on Moss and just say, fuck you. 
you, we're not going to do it. You come and arrest us. You come and drag us out of our stores in front of everybody in this community. And then let's see where that goes. Yeah. Let's see if you can Melbourne us. All right. I don't think it's going to happen. Yeah. I, you know, so one of the things I wanted to ask you about, and this is, this has been a concern for me the entire, since Trump became a candidate in 2015. And it's really a concern for me now is how roped into the right the alternative information community has become. Like the way I'm seeing people hoping and praying and begging for Trump and thinking that like the world will somehow be better, right? Like I'm, I agree with you. I'm, I don't, I don't like the Biden world order, right? But I mean, Trump is doing Operation Warp Speed. Trump is not is do is doing caca with Iran and Israel, and, and and he hasn't really so you know like there was a time when most people in the alternative information community were more on the libertarian or the anarchist or the voluntary voluntarist kind of tip, right? Or, or, or minarchist at least, but people have become, like I cannot believe some of the people that I see being very like, like, like we need Trump, like Trump is gonna save us kind of stuff, right? It's disturbing to me, like to, to, to watch the, them get roped in in this way, right? Like I don't like, to me, the only reason that I actually prefer Trump is because it's funny, right? It's funny to watch the left, you know, go through all of this, you know, flailing around and, and you know, hissy fits and whatever. But like, I don't see Trump as an ally for people who um, love freedom. Like maybe, you know, like he, because of the way he can't keep his mouth shut and he exposes truths, right, to a certain extent. And because he acts from ego and that sort of leads him to tell the truth about, he says the quiet part out loud. That's why the elite don't like him or supposedly don't like him, right? But to watch people be um, really this convinced that Trump is like, you know, one of the people or, or for us or whatever, to me shows that like the truth movement is a failure. Wow, that's a very heavy indictment. And I would say that there's some truth to that. Um, I would prefer, if we're gonna play this game, I would prefer Trump over Biden because I, he is more entertaining. Totally. And, yeah. and number two, there's the potential for more chaos around Trump. I agree, with that I totally agree with. And, and I think at the very least, things could get weird or it will invoke some other kind of counterforce mm -hmm. and continue to sort of put certain things at bay. I agree. But, but to sit here and think that, you know, he's going to come in and save the day. And um, I don't think, I don't think that's really going to happen. Um, I don't think it's going to happen. You know, but I, I, I think ultimately we, we know, we don't need, we don't need more presidential power. We don't need more cult of personality. We need less of it. Yep. And um, and that's the one thing that people have lost sight of with, yeah. with Trump is that you know they've they've glommed onto this cult of personality because he he's not politically correct for the most part. It's funny, yeah. Like it's funny and entertaining to watch, and I appreciate the effect that some of that stuff has. But like, whether it be people who had walked, stepped outside the system, got but rope, got roped back in through the Trump thing, or whether it even be like we ended up, we found ourselves in the middle of some Latinos for Trump parade on the way home from exercising last week, and these people, like it's the same way that you saw some people like feeling passionate about Obama when he right that he was going to be the hope and change. Like these people, like really think that Trump, you know, is the answer and cares about them. And I was just like, oh my God, like, have we learned nothing? You know what I mean? Kind of thing. And it's like, you know, while there's a part of me that enjoys seeing Latinos for Trump, because like the left's efforts at playing identity politics into getting, you know, the Latinos to vote for them have clearly failed. Fa like, the area that I live in is adjacent to a very big Latino area, right? And these are like the demographics that the left really wants to identity, you know, scare them with the wall and blah, blah, blah. And they're, they're out there in their trucks crying with their whole family, la, la, la. So I can totally appreciate like, the turnabout is fair play and that humor and all of that. But like these people, like th they think this is going to help them. Well, the Latino community has always identified with very strong patriarchal figures, yeah. you know, whether it's Castro or Maduro or, 
you know, they'd like these very, you know, or, or you know, Maximilian the first. I love these strong kind of macho, you know, strong men. They're into it. So Trump, you know, fits the bill. You know, he yeah. kind of slots into that that category. So, and I also think if you go back and look at the early days of hip hop, all all the, like the you know first and some second wave hip hop guys love Trump. Yeah, you know, they drop his name in songs and everything. They oh, thought like he, the dollar signs and the gold toilets and all that kind of shit. They love that shit. Yeah, yeah. So you know he fits into that. But it's about power, right? People, people resonate with power, and um, they see him as having some kind of power. Yeah, and, and that's why he's, you know, he's been largely successful in winning over the masses. Yeah. And, um, you know, speaking to the people in a way that they want to hear things like, you know, we're going to keep your jobs, we're going to keep your coal, we're going to keep your fracking, we're going to keep your oil, we're not going to, you know, bow to the communists and people want to hear that. And because people are scared, you know, yeah. they're scared, they had the this, this shit scared out of them over the summer with BLM. And, yeah. and, you know, and, I, and I think, again, that's all part of an operation. Yeah, you know, that the that the intel agencies are all over that, and probably both parties are you know knowing who's who and what's what, and that's why nobody ever gets arrested. You know, it's, would declassify everything. Uh, that would be awesome. Mm -hmm. I, I love that man. That would that would be like if he was really, really, really on the ropes. And I don't think he's getting out of office, by the way. Mm -hmm. But if he was really on the ropes and they were getting ready to go in and pull him out of there, I I would declassify everything. There's two things, like there's two, like if he really is a change agent, right? Or if he wanted to create maximum chaos for whatever reason, and I agree with you that with Trump, there is that element of chaos that doesn't exist for the other, the other. he'd declassify everything, including, everything. including the patents for free energy. I everything, let it rip, yeah. All the political shit and all the patents on free energy device, even if yep. he just classified the free energy shit to a yep. certain extent, right? Like then that would be like th that that would be a level of chaos that would be hard to recover from for for the you know you know stitched up establishment. But wouldn't it be great though? Because then we could just put a, a closure on everything. Totally. I mean, if every if it was all declassified, we could put a closure on everything, and that would really qualify as an official reset. Yeah. And there may be a lot of anguish, a lot of pain, and a lot of you know pissed off people. But we'd have closure, whatever it was. If he declassified everything, I don't consider a lot of people consider declassify everything just to classify find all the shit related to Russia Gate. No, when I, I say everything, everything, right? I'm with you. There was enough stuff in there to also piss the left off to the point where they won't believe in government anymore either. Everything, yeah. UFOs, free energy, 9/11, okay. Kennedy, yeah. Yeah. whatever, Federal Reserve, all that, everything, yeah. Just and just run it all through WikiLeaks. Boom. Have you seen? Oh, I think I, I don't know if I maybe closed this window. I went down this fucking weird rabbit hole. Maybe I closed the window. But remember, you told me to go look at. We were talking about like Pierce Morgan and who were we talking about? You were like John. You told me to look at John Trump, right? Right. Well, there was John Trump, and it was a Julian Assange. Julian Assange, right? And then there, and then there was the actor Colin. Was it Colin McHugh, or what's is that his name? Colin, I, right? You showed me this. Let me see if I can find. So you showed me this picture of right John. So remember, we were you were just talking about earlier. So this thing. Hold on. So this isn't what you showed me, but I found this. You, I I just found the. Uh, John Trump and the Julian Assange, right? But yeah. then I went looking at, and I, and I showed this on something I did with Michael. I went looking at it and what you were just saying about like being able to absorb people or if time doesn't exist in the way we think it is about two people coming together. Yeah. He literally looks like a combination of Julian Assange and Donald Trump. So that's the question. Is Julian Assange, are Donald Trump and Julian Assange related? Uh, quite possibly in, in this world that uh, that we're in, if, if Obama and Clinton are related through the Rockefeller line, mm -hmm. possibly. 
I mean, it, 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 it's so, when I saw this picture, I was like, wow, that is incredible. Right. Yep. Just put those two together. And that's exactly, I was like, wow. Um, yeah, no, I mean, this whole relationship Donald Trump has had to, with WikiLeaks and Julian Assange is interesting as well. Yeah, well. Yeah. Declassify uh, everything. I'm for that. Like whoever, whoever is going to get that one done, I'm for that. <laughs> do it. Just let it rip. Put, 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 it, put a ribbon on the 20th century and, the, and let's, let's move on. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's figure out what we're going to do with all the declassified information and fucking rock and roll. And rock and roll, man. Time space penetration, all that kind of stuff. Totally. Folding yeah. your tacos for everybody. Yeah. Space time tacos for everybody. Space time. That's, that's going to be the title. Space time tacos for everybody. All right. Well, hopefully when we're back next time in a couple of weeks, I'll have been approved and maybe we can uh, mash cast IRL a little super chat with our beanies. What do you think? Yeah, I'm into uh, I'm into it. I have a beanie. Do you have a beanie? I got more than one beanie. All right, I got one beanie. I got, right. options. I got options. You got options, and it, isn't it weird how fast Adam's 15 minutes of fame were over? I know. Right. So I think that he was just there to handle Tim through his transition, right, from being like this sort of refusal to commit to either side into a Trump supporter. Right. And if you look now, all of Tim's guests are like people who were like alt light or sort of right wing ish kind of stars at one point. Yeah. Right. People who are there, they there with him in the studio all the time. He moved out of the city. He lives out in the country now. And he's got all these people from various other kinds of media who seem to be there with him all the time. Like it's fucking weird, dude. It's like a commune for like, you know, it's, it's very bizarre. And we, like, apparently there's like a big skate park inside of his house and whatever. Like what, I think your, your, your assessment that maybe like Adam's father is like a handler, an agent or something like that. Uh, was, yeah, I don't know. Somebody told me something different, but he's, yeah, I don't think he is, but no. I don't know. He's, he, I guess Tim's doing okay, right? He's living the yeah. dream. It's crazy. I mean, it was, you know, it seemed like Adam was the, having the transformation into a, a, into a Trump supporter, but really it was, he was there to usher in Tim's transformation from, you know, into this sort of, I mean, if you listen, even today, every day, there's just, you know, videos that Tim is making that are defending the fact that, you know, like the media is all wrong and Trump is going to win and da, 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 and right. All of this kind of stuff. If you go back to like a year ago, it's a fascinating transformation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. He's a fence um, sitter on everything else except that. You know what I mean? Yeah. He's yeah. a fence sitter on everything. So, but yeah, Adam seems to be long gone. You know, it's interesting. Every time I would finish a Tim Pool video, there was always a Trump speech or a Trump rally that followed on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Always. Yep. Always. And then every time I finish a John Levi video, there's mm -hmm. always a video of like some traditional scientist. Right. Yeah. So YouTube cues shit up, right? Like, well, you just saw that maybe you'd really like to see this instead because this is real science or, oh yeah, you just saw this thing with uh, uh, Tim and Donald Trump. Well, how about some more Donald Trump? You know, so it's very interesting how they kind of bookend these videos. So you, you really like the John Levi stuff, huh? I, I, I like him because he's, uh, he's, I think he's very funny. Yeah. He has he's good very funny and he's very real. He turned me on to something that I'm pretty interested in right now that I'm looking into. And it, it's a, it's a, it's a bigger commitment than listening to John Levi stuff. Cause they don't wrap their stuff up in nice little sort of storybook, 20 to 40 minute videos. Right. But he turned me on to this channel called FPV angel. Uh -huh. um, go look there. Okay. <laughs> right. It's going to take you a little bit to figure out what you're looking at, but there's some fascinating stuff that goes into a lot of the things that we've been talking about here today in terms of like, where what's really going on, where we're really at, what this place even is. Um, they, I'll send you like an, an interview where they're breaking it down because some they, these people do like 12 hour live streams where they're showing all these things and decodings and stuff like that. But um, I'll find like a condensed thing so you can kind of get an idea about what they're talking about a little bit. Uh, it's hard to find. I'm, I'm going to try and get an interview with them so I can get a straight start to finish of what their narrative actually is because it's hard to to pull it out from what they have available. But uh, it's some really interesting stuff. Check I'll it check out. it out. 
Yeah. All right. We're going to wrap it up. You got any interesting offerings for the people these days? Anything people should know about? Well, you know, I'm still doing uh, astrological readings for people. And uh, a lot of people are still interested in relocating. So I'm helping a lot of people yep. relocate and look at their charts. And then, um, yeah, so I'm, I, I still have the uh, still have the sign on out front and it's, it's good. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Very good. I was just reloading some of our old shows onto BitChute, right, uh, the other day. And it was interesting. We really have, even before we started doing Matrix Mash, we had a lot of really amazing shows. So many interesting predictions and timely conversations and stuff like that that are still really valid with the things that we're looking at. So it was kind of a walk down memory lane. And in some of the show descriptions, which I just transferred from YouTube over to BitChute, and some of them you're offering specials. So maybe people are going to hit you up for specials. <laughs> You might get enough for specials for a new group of people. But anyway, um, so sorry if you get people thinking that they're getting a discount when they're not. So awesome, guys. I highly, I've had many readings from Robert. I highly recommend finding him over at robertphoenix.com and, and joining that he has one of the best chat rooms uh, on YouTube in the mornings at 15 Minutes of Flame, right? Like lots of interesting people there, kind people who care about each other and whatnot, and also always interesting information being delivered by Robert. And they're funny. There are some very funny people. Very funny people. In that chat room. Like, like, and they have, they are not politically correct. Yeah. It's fun. It's a good time. I really like it. I really like it. And uh, awesome. All right. So you can catch us hopefully back here in a couple of weeks with uh, some more offerings for you guys. I'm doing Jeff and K I'm going to put this up tonight um, by request. Um, Jeff, who's here visiting me and I are going to be doing a little workshop this weekend on, um, I don't know if you're familiar with BSV, but it's a cryptocurrency that has been, Coinbase won't let it be bought or sold on, on their site, right? And right. I'm not pro or anti cryptocurrency. I think it's something that we need to understand because whether you like it or not, it is something coming in the future and not all of them are created equal. And this one seems to have been blacklisted by all the corrupt systems, right? And it seems to me to have a different level of uh, sort of integrity and intent than some of the others, but it also is, there's a bunch of um, related technologies that are being rolled out with it as well, um, that I think may offer some options even for people like you and I, as we decide where we're going to put our information and how we're going to distribute it and all of that kind of stuff going forward. Um, so this is not about whether cryptocurrencies are good or bad or any fin financial advice. It's just how to obtain and securely use this particular cryptocurrency and its related applications and technologies. Um, there are people who are working on things related to it. Like there's a version of, of Twitter called Twetch that is on the blockchain. So your channel cannot be deleted. Your tweets cannot be deleted. And it's what's called the polite society because if somebody wants to leave a nasty comment, they have to pay you to leave you a nasty comment. Right, so that it, it kind of avoids trolling. There is a YouTube version kind of thing in the works called Streamanity, and there are people associated with it who are working on like encrypted blockchain versions, secure versions of applications like Zoom um, and uh, various other kinds of uh, of things. Um, and so it's just it's just something interesting and different to maybe get to understand. Like maybe I don't think that there's like some um, holy grail or or like panacea of like perfect kind of cryptocurrency or anything like that. But this one seems to be very, uh, uh, the, the, the systems won't even talk about it, right? So they want people to know about it. Jeff has been playing with it for a couple of years now and mm -hmm. seems to know a lot about it. He's walked me through the steps of how to do it. There are definitely some interesting aspects to it. So we're doing a little workshop on how to obtain certain securely use uh, BSV and the related um, technologies. And that's on Saturday from one to three. So if anybody would like to join, um, hit me up for details and all that jazz. And we will see you guys next time. Robert, it's always a pleasure. I missed you this past month, my friend. I think it's been a busy one for both of us, but it was good to get back together with you. And I always look forward to it. Yeah. Bye, everybody. We'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.